today for this webinar that is co-sponsored and underwritten by the Rochester Business Alliance. Firestorm, predict, plan, perform, is making this presentation today. And our speaker is uh, Jim Satterfield. Our moderator today uh, from the R Rochester Business Alliance is Chip Dawson. And Chip will be making some comments in the very near future. <laughs> if you wish, you may follow us on uh, uh, Twitter using the hashtag pound sign crisis coach or hashtag crisis coach. Please uh, join us and be our friend on Firestorm Solutions and uh, visit our webpage at firestorm.com. Firestorm, as you know, transforms crisis into value. We empower you to manage and risk make risks and crises. Firestorm has expertise in crisis management, crisis communication, crisis response, and also planning and training. Our lawyers like us to make this disclaimer. The presentation is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. The work product should be read in conjunction with all guidance given by national, regional, and local authorities, as well as your company's, your organization's personal counsel. Moreover, the information should not be interpreted as legal advice or legal opinion. The Rochester Business Alliance is the co-sponsor of this series. This is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series. This is the second in our series. Today we're talking about Next We Plan. Our next presentation will be related to time as it matters most, December the 12th. Hope you can join us for that. You may watch past webinars and register for future webinars by visiting firestorm.com slash RBA. As I mentioned, this webinar series is underwritten by the Rochester Business Alliance. Chip, turn it over to you for some introductory comments here. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second in the series of the Crisis Coach. The Rochester Business Alliance is delighted to partner with Firestorm to bring you, our members, this fascinating hour-long discussion by Jim Satterfield, one of the country's top crisis managers, covering another topic critical to effective emergency management and business continuity. I've been involved in emergency management for over 60 years, really 60 years, and yet every time I talk with or listen to Jim Satterfield, I learn something new. You're in for a treat today. Before we begin, let me remind you that your first point of contact before, during, and after an emergency is the Rochester Business Alliance. That is, of course, after you call 911. As an organization, we hold seat in the Monroe County Emergency Operations Center. We provide team and individual training on emergency management, and we can link you with Firestorm anytime the problem challenges your skills and knowledge. It's a partnership designed to keep you out of trouble and help with quick recovery if bad things do happen. With our best wishes for a safe and happy holidays, here's Jim. Thanks, Chip. Those are great words. I don't think I can live up to it, but I'm impressed with your 60 years of experience. I, I didn't realize that you were helping NOAA uh, get the ark out and uh, those other activities as we come together. Almost, so, uh, Jim. I was, uh, I was on a lake rescue unit at age 14. <laughs> I tell you, that's impressive to get those uh, things together. I think uh, I appreciated your comments. Uh, we're all in this together, and we're going to have opportunities. Uh, just as we were starting this morning, uh, Chip was sharing uh, the snow is beginning to come, which uh, in Rochester isn't a surprise to anyone at this time of year. And looking at all the types of impacts that would occur on businesses. Uh, before we start today, we want to give a, an update of what's going on in the news, related to the topics that we've been talking about. And the very first one here is certainly something that when we think about business continuity in crisis, uh, there was just a report released this morning, just moments before our broadcast, that it's estimated that 80 million uh, people with employer health policies could have coverages canceled. Well, that's going to be a significant morale issue within corporations. It could be workplace violence. It could be a significant component when you look at that number, if it comes anywhere close to those types of numbers, you're talking about 25% of the population in America. And when you look at the, the families that are tied to those uh, health policies, it's probably closer to 40% uh, 
Uh, so that's a significant story. Please watch your news as that uh, continues to develop in the next few days. Uh, police used Facebook just this week <clears throat> to stop a teen suicide. We're seeing increasingly social media as being a point of reference to help uh, organizations identify what they need to do and when they need to do it. College campuses continue to have outbreaks of a variety of things, including violence. Uh, we had a lockdown yesterday at Yale, but this is a story about Princeton here with a meningitis outbreak, and they had to get special permission from uh, the CDC to import the uh, vaccine to deal with that. Anytime you have people in close quarters, your potential for a communicable illness outbreak is accelerating. We also now are starting to see regulators requiring uh, the testing of your communicable illness or a pandemic plan. I know that's certainly true today in the banking and financial sector. Uh, the mayor of T Toronto, I don't know that we can say much about him other than obviously the crisis management and crisis communications plans there uh, leave a lot uh, to uh, be considered. The typhoon that hit the Philippines certainly was horrific. 250 mile an hour wind, uh, thousands of people killed, the disruption, and the ultimate impact on the U.S. economy. When you look at the call centers and the other support functions coming out of the Philippines, that's a significant supply chain disruption. Uh, Liberty University had a shooting this uh, past week. Uh, we had a uh, carbon monoxide leak in an elementary school, particularly lower areas. You look at the concentration, the whole protection of your identity and information. There was a report just released that people used 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 as their password, over almost 2 million people doing that. Uh, clearly not an area that we need to focus on. There's an idea here when we think about all of the subjects that uh, Chip referenced earlier and even some of the implications above, that this is part of a continuous improvement process. Uh, within your company, if you're in the manufacturing segment, you're thinking about Sig Sigma, lean manufacturing, those types of areas. Well, the same thing happens when we talk about business continuity, resilient communities, and we've got communities that are at significant risk. There's uh, some highlights that tie those communities together, that there are no quick fixes, that the government doesn't have all the answers, and that shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us in our talk today, and that the, but the government can play a role in asking the right questions. Chip, it sounds like your puppy there is uh, talking to us a little bit through this. Can we put the puppy on? I think uh, it would be a, a good uh, addition to our call. Get I'm sorry, on. Jim. I thought we were on mute, but uh, that's that's part of emergency management. I'll figure out how to fix it. Well, that's the joy of live uh, broadcast, everybody. It shows that we can operate our businesses anywhere at any time, and that's an important element. So as we move out of all of those things, it's talking about measuring, are you ready? Are you sure? How do you know? And those would be activities that you should think about within your business. Uh, do you have clients that are requiring you to uh, evaluate where you are? Do you have regulators that are looking at those activities? And to know what your, your goals are within your program would be a good opportunity. Uh, the Firestorm self-assessment, the, the cost of that is being underwritten by the Rochester Business Alliance. It's a $2,500 value. But it combines a couple of interesting things. In, in addition, to giving you an assessment of where you are relative to standards and best practices, it will give you a maturity rating along with benchmarking against other companies across the country. So that self-assessment will take you about an hour. It focuses on the dimensions that you see moving across your screen now and aligns with the current standards that are in the market. That's an opportunity if you're thinking about as a beginning step, where do you start? It might be a good place to begin. So today we're going to continue in our discussions around the predict, plan, perform process, uh, understanding the vulnerabilities, their impacts, the threats, uh, how do you monitor, what are the triggers. We'll talk about various kinds of plans, and we're going to get into some of the planning area today and focus around that. And in future webinars, we'll be talking about the perform, the training, the exercises, the monitoring, the supplies, the actual crisis management. So that's an overview of really the whole series and everything that we're, we're looking for. By the way, the predict, plan, perform works if you find yourself in a crisis 
are trying to deal with an issue that's rapidly developing. So how do all these plans start to come together and fit? Uh, the chart that you see in front of you shows you where you're starting, and it, it shows a little bit of it over time with the intensity of the crisis or disaster happening. Ahead of time, we've got an opportunity to understand where we are and start to develop our plans, our training, and, and getting those things available to all of our people. And we listed a variety of different plans under that first section. At the onset, as Chip pointed out, we've got the emergency response. You've got the coordination with the first responders, the activation of your plan. You then do an impact assessment to determine how bad is it, making those types of decisions that you need to make, then transitioning into a response and recovery, and then in a post-incident area. Now, plans can be simple or they can be complex. Here's a fairly complex-looking chart taking those same five stages and then showing you a little bit of what you'd be doing. And we posted this to show you uh, about specifically a crisis management plan. So you make sure your employees are ready, your plans are ready, doing the training, the exercises, verifying that your critical vendors, identifying them and making sure that their plans are in place. The event occurs, you activate your emergency response plan, your incident plan. You begin to monitor facts as they're developed you activate your crisis management plan. And then as you are pulling your team together, you're assessing how bad is it, uh, how serious. If it's not bad, you're going to stand down. If it is bad, then you're going to then shift into the activation of restoring your business functions, uh, identifying the metrics and the stakeholders, restoring physical and virtual access, uh, and establishing command and control. Because you'll lose command and control in an event. And when, by the time you've got everything back operational from the, the event that started, that's the arrow along the bottom of the chart. It shows you the recovery time objectives and priorities as you start to put together. And that's a part of your business continuity plan as we look at each one of those areas. But once it's even over, you still are going to be faced with crisis PR, critical decision support, and return to a new normal. So at the very beginning, people are asking, what should we know? And during the event, what supplies do they need? Where should they go? And then under the consequence area, what should they do now? What should they say? So all of these things begin to interrelate. And that's what we're going to start to talk about today as we talk about the planning process and what's required within your organization as we go forward. So the, the words here, this is a wordle with all those various words listed around it. But when we think about business continuity, getting your business back up and running, it's certainly a complex series of activities. It's got employees involved. It's got response. It's got natural events. It's got man-made events, um, identification of those, training. All of those elements have to come together. So there's a great deal of work for you to look at. Today, we're going to focus just on three specific plans. We're going to look at your emergency response plan, a security plan, and a crisis communications plan. Now, we could have added workplace violence. We could have added communicable illness. We could have added crisis management. All of those will ultimately need to be worked on as we uh, think about them. But I want to start to give you a framework so that you can begin to look at your company to design specifically what is it that you need to do and operate in those areas. The first thing I want to emphasize is that plan details matter. Um, this is the definitive document that your team was going to have to rely on to respond. To be most effective, they have to be concise, easy to follow, and most importantly, actionable. Now, that is a big issue, and we see that as the most common failure when we review plans. And we've reviewed hundreds and hundreds of plans across wide varieties of industries, schools, and businesses. And they tell people what to do, but don't tell them how to do it. And that what versus how is going to really be the primary focus of our uh, conversation today is we're looking at the business to try to help you understand the level of detail that you need to do. Now, using plain language is very important. You want to have the simplest word, and you want to have the roles and responsibilities clearly defined. And you've got to have responses for each one of the threats, risks, 
exposures, the vulnerabilities that you find within your organization. Now, if we were doing a business continuity plan as opposed to an emergency plan, we'd be looking at your critical vendors. We'd be looking at a lot of different activities. But we're going to zero in today on probably the easiest area for you to think about, and that's the incident response, the emergency response that you'd want your people to do at the time that you need them to do it. Um, we also find that companies figure, well, we held an orientation and we brought them on the board and we showed them, well, here's the exit, this thing goes off, you go out there, this is what you need to do. But people forget if they're not reminded, if you don't test, if you don't exercise your plan, it's not going to work. And finally, there is no one size that fits all in this business. Um, it also varies from location to location. And as we talk about evacuation in just a few minutes, you're going to see a big difference between what happens in New York City versus what happens in Rochester in terms of being able to evacuate. So you've got to match your code, your procedures within your area. In taking a plan that somebody else wrote, changing the name on the cover to yours isn't going to help you in those areas. So you need to think about those elements as we work into our plan and carry forward today. So here's a simple emergency response plan. Uh, we cut off the name of the client so that you wouldn't have those names. But the tabs here, there's a plan framework, a plan overview, the crisis response overview, emergency communications roles and responsibilities. And this client was concerned about those items uh, five through 15. They were the particular concerns in their business. The tabs that you would have would be different. And as you see from item 10, this was written for school because it said loss or missing student. Then appendices could be your external contacts, uh, call scripts that you would need to, emergency response forms, the campus plan. So your emergency response plan would have a table of contents that would match your particular business and what you need to do. But now let's go through a sample of that type of an emergency plan and specifically think about what would be needed within a company. Now, this is local IRT stands for an incident response team. You may be using an emergency response team, a crisis response team, an emergency team. Whatever your language within your company is, that's certainly fine for you to use. But it's also good to tie this in with what you have in place with your fire program. There's a simple uh, area because you're required to do annual fire drills. You're required to have a fire warden and searchers and disability aids. So taking that same combination together would make a big difference as you start to pull it along in the area. Now, for this particular client, we created flipbooks. Um, it would be tabbed so that it would be clear to explain what they needed to do in each one of the areas. And this was a large law firm. Uh, now, here's a real surprise. Not everybody likes attorneys. So they had a particular set of exposures uh, that they were subjected to that other clients might not have. But having very clear chain of command, preventative measures, the emergency communications, the evacuation roles and responsibilities, all of those elements needed to be spelled out and in addition to the things that you and I would normally expect to find, inclement weather, natural disasters, other types of elements that were associated with it. Now, whether yours is a flip book or a binder or a notebook or a trifold, having everything identified makes a big, big difference. Now, what I want to do is take these concepts and move down the road, and we're going to use fire as an example because that's fairly straightforward, but the same ideas of evacuation would apply for any reason that you had to evacuate. So when you think about fire wardens and deputy wardens, you'll notice that we had a picture there of uh, a walkie-talkie to be able to communicate because sometimes cell phone communications are not good. So one of the things when we're designing a plan and working with a client, we'd want to know is the cell communication good throughout the entire building or are there dead spots. Increasingly, we're finding that there are multiple dead spots, and so that's why the ability to have walkie-talkies are there. Also, as I'll go back just one little bit here to show you again, having the vest, having the, the helmet, 
gives clearer level of visual authority in those types of areas. So when time really matters, and we're going to talk about time next month, you want to make it very clear to your people who they should be listening to and what they should need to be doing. Now you'll also see at the head of this slide, it says fire wardens and deputy wardens. Uh, a general rule of firestorm is HR rule one, two, three. You need to be three deep at every position within your company. Somebody could be out sick today, they could be um, in a situation where uh, they're on holiday. Who else would be there to be able to handle those responsibilities and carry forward? But let's delve a little bit more into this area of fire wardens and deputy wardens um, as we look at it. Now you'll notice this, and I want you to read these words in light of the how to do it as opposed to just what to do. If the alarm sounds upon hearing the fire alarm, command evacuation of employees. That's a very set of specific actions that tells you how to go about doing that. Direct the personnel to the near stairwell, and after checking for smoke, fire, or contaminants, instruct employees uh, to wait there for further instruction from the building fire marshal. Now, that those instructions were written for a high-rise building in uh, major metropolitan areas. If you're in a more rural campus environment, you will probably want them to move ahead with the, if directed or deemed necessary, walk downstairs to the exit of the building. At no time shall uh, an employee, shall a fire warden uh, direct evacuees to use elevators unless directed to do so by the fire department. We all know that elevators, you don't want to be trapped in one, you've got smoke, you've got heat, and carry forward from, from those areas. Uh, now, one of the common problems that we find where there's a, a company campus with multiple buildings is that the PA system doesn't work on all floors at the same uh, time. Uh, in these particular buildings, it's founded on all floors, and it could be heard uh, from all floors from, from each of those areas. Those are very important, very clear directions, and you would understand what you would need to do. But what else is it that we're asking our wardens to do? Uh, have the evacuation route clearly planned. Um, it's important to walk down the stairwells. Where do they exit? Do they exit into a lobby? Do they exit to the exterior of the building? Where? How do people move away from the building at those particular points? And as we talked about, there's a difference depending upon the city. In New York, in a high-rise building, if there's a fire alarm, you're instructed to go down two floors and re-enter the building uh, because that's the code in New York City. So you need to understand what's the code in your particular uh, area that you're held to as you go forward. Um, you want to have people pre-assigned to help people with disabilities. Uh, is, somebody, uh, is somebody in firm? Is someone in a, in, on crutches or a wheelchair? Did they just go skiing and break their legs? Are they going to need assistance? Uh, you'll be surprised the higher your building, the more people that just walking down flights of stairs can be a physical challenge. And having a person assigned to them will make a big difference. Also remember that this would apply equally to guests or visitors in your property. Uh, if you've got vendors in, if you have clients in that you're talking with, if you've got the public. And as you do uh, a drill or an exercise, that third bullet, identify weak points during the fire drill. What is it that's not working for you? What is it that is not clear? Now the fourth is a, a equally important, maintaining up-to-date organizational charts. Um, if you've got a business with as many as 50 employees, you probably have reached the level of complexity for having a software system that's a relational database that ties all of your plans together would be a big advantage. Therefore. As you updated one area, it would pre-populate across all the forms and all the information within. Uh, you should obviously train your people, uh, particularly if you've had changes with people that are deputies and searchers, and we'll talk about searcher responsibilities in a few minutes. But you can see these same set of instructions would apply regardless of the reason that you're having to do an evacuation. Um, you want to look at the area regularly. You know, we were working with a manufacturer in New Jersey, and it was amazing how suddenly the fire exits were a convenient place to store some uh, work and process that would slow down an evacuation in that area. 
identifying that before there's a crisis, before there's an actual fire, makes a significant difference. Um, the fire ward identification, fire ward identification, that's the vest or the hat or helmet, would make a big difference. And uh, again, we have everyone would have to know the plans associated with it. Now, for searcher, as you look at them, they're responsible to make sure that the people are directed to the exit and uh, identify those that need any assistance. They need to be completely familiar with their floor. So if you've got two or three floors in a building, uh, you would have people assigned with those floors, but even on other floors, because they could be going down to a different floor for a meeting in a conference room or a meeting with another department uh, to understand those areas. Knowing where the stairways are and where the emergency exits are are extremely critical. Uh, and again, for guests in your meeting, for visitors, for contractors, for clients, starting that meeting in your conference room and saying, if the alarm sounds, the fire exit is located out our door and to the left, and we will all move in that direction. Having that conversation and doing it before every meeting or even having a tent card in your conference room is an easy way to communicate that to make sure that everyone is safe at a time you need them uh, to, uh, to be safe. Be com completely familiar with those people who require special assistance, physical, hearing impaired, non-ambulatory, et cetera. So these, this, this is what a searcher is required to do in order to uh, start this process. Additionally, the first thing they would do is to search their signed area upon hearing the evacuation instructions. Now, that's a very clear command, telling them, here are a series of things that you have to do, and here's the first. From that, they would then go to the washrooms, storage areas, file rooms, and any other areas where employees may be located and potentially didn't hear the uh, evacuation signal. So it's not just the office space. It's just not the cubicles. It's just not the production floor. You have to do a clean sweep on each of those individual areas. Uh, and stand by the area until the people have evacuated. Your physical presence will make a difference in going from there. So it's not enough to go to an area and say, everybody needs to leave. The alarm is sound and continue to move, because then you have no firsthand knowledge that they, in fact, have carried out your action. Physically standing there and telling them that they need to move is exactly the correct action, and the level of clarity is very clear at this point in time. You direct them to the nearest stairway where the fire warden will direct them down. So you've got the searcher out on the floor directing them to the stairway, stairwell, and then you've got the deputy warden or warden there getting them down the stairs and then to leave the building. And when you're searching and you're going through, we recommend that you uh, close the door. So if you, the fire department responds, and if they know there's a closed door, they know there's no one on the other side of the door. That door, even if it's not a fire-rated door, will restrict the spread of the fire, cutting down oxygen, helping to buy more time for others within that space. And it is also the confirmation that it's been completely searched and under your control at that point in time. And then lastly, when we think about it, you would report the status that, you know, I've checked everything, and from here back to the north side of the building, or here back to the accounting department, or here to the HR department, or some area that would make sense. I have looked at it. Uh, and there's no one there. If you can't locate them, then that's where the handheld radios, or if you're in an area where there's good cell phone communication, you could uh, via cell report to them that the floor is evacuation is now complete, and the searcher, along with any unused disability aids, would then move forward to um, leave the building. The fire wardens then would notify and report back to your incident response team or your emergency team or your crisis team, however you're, stru you're structured at this point in time. What I'm trying to show you here with these slides is that there's a level of detail that provides clarity. It's simple. It's straightforward. <laughs> but 
it's the type of information that you would need to put together in each one of the exposures that you're faced with. But the examples here under evacuation are good regardless of what the ultimate cause was. Now, disability aid, and here you see a list of access issues. There's a look for those coworkers or visitors or guests that need help. Uh, there to help them, uh, again, not to use the elevators. Uh, do, you can't evacuate people in their wheelchairs. You're not going to try to take wheelchairs down a set of stair, uh, stairwell areas for, from that. Uh, and if you haven't had the training, don't attempt it. Just get them to the exit. Then coordinate with your fire warden so the fire department can come and help with that evacuation of the physically impaired person. Uh, that's an extremely important element. And I would suggest that you, as you do with any planning, whether it's emergency or crisis, meet with your local first responders, your fire, your police, your paramedics, so that they're already familiar with your building, understand what the types of threats that you have. Also, when the fire department responds to the building, they get a description of the type of people that are in the space who may need this level of assistance. Um, so getting a list of those people who need the assistance, getting that in the hand uh, will be important. The note down there, if you're in a building that's managed by a third-party manager, uh, then making sure they're aware of who within your company, where are they located, who has a disability issue, who needs some assistance will be extremely helpful. So in general, when we're talking about evacuation, um, the fire marshal, uh, the building marshal, the fire warden, the IRT team member will initiate the evacuation. Um, if, however your alert system goes out, if that's a bell, if it's a paging, and the move is to get people out of the building. If it's a non-fire emergency, the, IR, the, IR, the incident response team may deem it appropriate to evacuate the building but keep to keep the employees safe. <coughs> there may be a threat inside of the building that's greater than the threat outside of the building. So that's obviously the reason why you would want to evacuate. And the wardens then assure the incident response team that everybody has uh, been cleared from the building. Now, <coughs> so general procedures, people need to learn where the stairwell is at. They need to walk them from their exit. Now, in a one or a two-story building, that's not as much of a challenge. If you're in a major metropolitan area, if you're in downtown Rochester, you're in a 20-story building, there are individuals that will have difficulty walking down that many flights. Uh, to be carried forward. The idea of having a safe and OK hotline to report back into is extremely beneficial. If you've trained your people in advance, that if there is an evacuation, once they're safe, they're to call a particular number. I'm showing an 800 one here. But it could be a different number to let them know, let you know that they're accounted for. Having a virtual meeting place is a strategic advantage for an organization in this level of planning. Uh, emergency packs, uh, the types of things that you may need to take with you, uh, a flashlight, uh, uh, some water, uh, a nutrition bar, maybe uh, a parker uh, covered for that. Uh, again, depending upon the type of an evacuation that you would need to have, having it designed. Uh, if you would like to know about what emergency supplies you need in your area or your company. We work with a firm called Nexus, and they have software like the facilitated assessment that we described earlier for business continuity or other areas that can help you determine what are the supply needs that you need to have within your company for the exposures that you've identified. And uh, we will get them to do uh, a waiver of the fee associated with that assessment. If that's something you want, let us know, and we'll be glad to coordinate that. <coughs> Again, general evacuation procedures. These will be the types of things that will be given to all employees. Uh, gathering your personal belongings, people are going to need car keys. 
there's a situation here, though, that you want to make sure that people understand. If they're in one part of the building and there's an evacuation that's declared, they're not to go back to their desk to get their personal item. They're to leave from that conference room and not return back to their traditional work area. Those are very important areas to stress. We've seen that not work effectively in a crisis where individuals have to feel like they need to go back to their desk to get those things done. Um, you see the reference to falling debris down there upon exiting the building. Move away from the danger area as quickly as you can. But explain this to your people. Going through it, and then as you do a fire drill, as you do an exercise, stressing these various elements. Hopefully you're seeing in the slides that we're showing you today a level of detail that's a little bit more than what you would think of about a normal evacuation type of an experience. Now, updated information. As we look at things, uh, the authority of the location is the incident response team. If you've got a corporate organization, you're not going to call up the headquarters in another town and say, by the way, uh, the fire's in the building, should I leave? Uh, imagine a, a phone skit uh, with Bob Newhart uh, pretending he's on the telephone. He's going, yes, sir, well, uh, we've got a fire and we need to evacuate. Well, is the fire, t no, no, the fire's not to our uh, door. Well, I see, we have to wait until the fire gets to our door before we evacuate. Well, that's ridiculous. So what you're looking here is to put authority in your teams to let them make the decision that they need to make. We also recommend that you don't have a specific physical assembly area. We're seeing with workplace violence episodes around the country that there's a tendency to throw a fire alarm to get everyone then to head out and you know where the departments or where the individuals are that you're upset with are going to assemble. So it creates a secondary target area uh, by having identified assembly areas. That's why we recommend a virtual assembly area where people report in. Wallet cards are a great idea. They're quick, simple information, the number to call, the basic facts, what people need to do. It's not a big expense, and it's certainly an area that will give the essential elements to everyone that you have. Remember, you're responsible not only for your employees, but for all the visitors that you have within your location. Contractors, customers, vendors, suppliers, trade people, they are all you need to be aware of. And then the Safe and OK hotline is a good opportunity for you to identify that within your organization so that that way you've got the communications. You can certainly put a message on your Safe and OK hotline to confirm what's going on at those individual points. So we spent a lot of time talking about fire today. And really what we want to know is that you're your own first responder. You are responsible for your safety, and that's what we want to communicate to every employee within our organization. And again, they have the responsibility to act if they feel that their life is in imminent danger. So walking those stairwells, knowing the exits, knowing how they work, makes a significant difference to make these individuals happen. Now, we spent a lot of time on an emergency response plan. Let's talk about a couple of other things quickly as we uh, wrap up today. First is the security plan. Do you have a security plan within your area? Uh, workplace violence is a significant threat. There are over two million episodes of workplace violence annually in the United States. And it's not just visitors. It's employee on employee. It's a variety of different elements that are associated with it. OSHA has identified workplace violence as a known hazard. You're required to have a plan, yet the majority of organizations don't. So what you would do in those situations, you begin to spell out. And here are some of the uh, security plan components that you'd be thinking about within your particular area. Access controls. Is there a panic button in the general lobby? Is there video surveillance? Do you have visitors badges uh, for employees to walk in and to, to be seen? Um, we're working with a, an organization out in San Francisco, and they have an interesting visitor path 
uh, that's done. It's a paper uh, felt adhesive uh, identification that the visitor would have with their name, their company. And there's a little circular box, and in that is a stop sign. Uh, when you receive the pass, the stop sign is clear. You can't see it. After 24 hours, the paper is treated chemically, and that stop sign, the red stop sign, comes up. So it clearly would identify, here's a person that hasn't been approved today to be in our space. So access control systems, uh, doors, locks, keys, cards, those things become very, very important. By the way, if you're doing card access into your buildings and do that, we recommend that you do not put your company name on that card because if you do, then you've directed the person who steals the card to know exactly where they need to go and use that one. Anonymous reporting is an issue that we see many organizations uh, fail in completely. Having the ability for someone to come up and say, I'm concerned about this person. I think they may have a substance problem. I'm concerned about some of the things that they're saying. If you don't have an anonymous reporting as a key element within your security system, you're missing a great opportunity. Uh, candidate employee screening, background checks, and if you're in an area that's dealing with children, like schools or daycare or other areas, the, the best practices uh, at this point are annual background screening to know what's happening with that person at this time, not what's happening when we hired them three or four or five years ago. How you notify people, having very clear notifications, and you don't want to be too cute here for people, well, one bell means this, two bells mean that, or the other areas, the clearer they are, the better they are. All right, let me see if I can get my volume up. Is that, uh, I was, Bill told me that I was being too quiet which is obviously not a comment that I get later. Hardening of the premises uh, becomes important within uh, your business and uh, making sure it's secure. The one there that's headed next, local law enforcement relationships. Invite the police department in your area, or the sheriff, county, or city uh, to come and uh, take a look at your property, what else needs to be put into place as you've gone forward and looking at it. So here are a host of different elements that would all go together to create a security plan within your organization. We won't drill down into each of these to the level of detail that we did with the emergency plan for evacuation, but that same level of detail would apply to each one of these as you're going forward and looking at those areas. One other uh, piece of advice associated with this, if you have video monitoring, uh, at your entrance or in your building or around your space, we recommend that you put up a sign that says premises under video surveillance. The sign is almost as effective as the video uh, surveillance because what that does is it, quote, hardens your location and it helps the uh, individual who might have had your ill intent in mind to move to another location to consider a different uh, area to carry forward. So monitoring, the physical security, surveillance, all of those elements play a role as you're designing the security plan. Now communicating, uh, if there's an event, you're going to need to talk both internally and externally. You're going to have to communicate with your people uh, to say what you want to do uh, and what, what has occurred. Again, uh, you want to be clear, you're never going to lie, but you want to frame your messages ahead of time. If you are explaining, you're losing. So if there's an ongoing investigation, if there's a threat, uh, if something had happened, an environmental release, uh, uh, another element associated with it, you do not want to be talking about that research. You do not want to talk about those particular elements. The authorities that are doing the investigation will talk about it. If you're in a regulated space, they will be the leading those types of things. And we'll give you some sample messages to think about in just a few minutes as we go forward. Social media can be a benefit. It is also a risk associated with this. But the time to set up a social media communication, uh, a Facebook page, a, a Twitter account, uh, how you plan those things, need to be identified in advance of use. 
you're not going to suddenly say, well, we've never been on Facebook, we've just had this problem, we'll set this up. You need to have that identified. Also, a backup website could be another way that you could certainly uh, be able to use those activities uh, as you carry forward. The uh, media training, you want to be 3D. You want to have uh, three people identified that were ready to be a spokesperson at the time of crisis. That's that HR 1, 2, 3 rule that we talked about earlier today. Because there's something could happen. The first person could be involved in the event, could be managing it, could have been hurt. So you're going to need to have at least a second and a third person identified there. By the way, we recommend that that not be your president uh, of your company at that point. Now, there certainly will be a time for your most senior leadership to communicate, but they'll be managing the crisis, they'll be involved in it, and a great deal of what you learn in the first 24 hours is generally wrong. So having an understanding of that will make a big difference and let this other par these other parties be the communicators that are associated with it. So as we move from that and writing your crisis communications plan, framing your messages, doing your message maps, becomes absolutely critical. Now, the message maps really are built around home bases. And I'll give you an example of some in just a minute. And there, uh, we look at the, the crisis management work we did at Virginia Tech after the shootings there uh, a number of years ago. And the three key messages for Virginia Tech were that they wouldn't be defined by the event, that they would invent the future, and they would embrace the family. If you find yourself in a crisis situation, those three messages converted to your particular application will become very critical in helping you to respond effectively. Will not be defined by the event, will invent the future, will embrace the family. Well, I know we had a, uh, an, an environmental release today. That's not who we are. We're going to look at the causes of that and make sure that it never happens again. Our hearts go out to those that were directly impacted. Now, that's the way to take those three messages, adapt them for the situation that you, you find yourself. By the way, those three messages, you don't give all three at one time. You give the first message, you get the next question, you give the next, and then you get the third question, you give the next. All subsequent messaging is a variation of these three themes. So breaking those down into three points under each one of them would certainly be uh, an acceptable strategy. Now, up on the screen now are some message maps that were created. This was a school uh, environment that I'm using as an example today. So you'll see the home bases will not be defined by the event. And their, their statement was, we're proud of our 40-year tradition and child-centered philosophy and are committed to learning in a safe environment. That's a will not be defined by the event. Eventing the future is the name of the school, is committed to providing the finest level of education to our students in a safe environment. Notice the repetition of safe environment uh, from the first to the second message. And then the third, about embracing the family, our thoughts and prayers are with all those affected. So those home bases would work for this school for a variety of different threats that they're associated with. So if you're wanting to work on what your messaging would be for your organization, you can number your messages. What is your question? Who is the stakeholder that you're talking to? Are you talking to employees? Are you talking to customers? Are you talking to vendors? Are you talking to regulators? Are you talking to the general public? What's your first key message associated with that question? What's your second? What's your third? And the medium is how are you communicating? Is this something you're going to be putting in an email? Is it something you're going to be holding a press conference for? Is it something you're going to be saying in your call center? Um, is it something you're training your individuals to do? If you take this table and use that as a format, you now have a tool to begin the sharing of that information with what you're moving forward. So today what we tried to do was to talk about the how, not just the what, of planning, of putting those things together as you start to plan. We took something fairly simple, a fire plan, 
and started giving you the level of detail that explains that how that you want to make sure is present within your organization and maintained at those individual levels. We then expanded that a little bit and talked about the security plan and then finally the communications plan. As part of the webinar series that we're doing uh, with the Rochester Business Alliance, in future ones we will be going more into the business continuity and the crisis management aspects of it. But today we're trying to build a foundation on which you can train your people so that they're aware, both from an evacuation standpoint, a security standpoint, and then how your communications would work. So we covered a lot of information, and hopefully you found it helpful uh, today as we started to try to give you that framework. Uh, Bill, I don't know if we've got any questions. Uh, do we have a question at this point, Bill? Uh, we invite I'm people to use the to come off mute. Yeah, <laughs> please use the question facility to uh, to enter any questions you might have. Uh, you mentioned earlier the self-assessment. Could you explain how we can get that? All right, the uh, self-assessment, uh, Bill. I had that as the next slide, so you were either uh, omniscient here or. Uh, at least on top of the game from that standpoint. It's a $2,500 assessment, and that's being waived uh, by the Rochester Business Alliance. They're underwriting the cost of this for your particular business. As you look at that, it will be a, an interview situation where you would sit down with a person who has the knowledge of your plans and, uh, and someone from Firestorm. We would do an interview. We look at some 11 different dimensions and we look at five data points in each of those 11 dimensions around this area of business continuity. Or if you prefer to have an assessment on workplace violence or another area, let us know. We, could be, we would be delighted to, to do that. You then get uh, an oral review of the results and then a findings report approximately 18 pages along where it would explain where you are on a narrative basis within each dimension as well as a uh, quantitative scoring as a percentage of best practices, and then you can benchmark against other companies. You can go to firestorm.com and request that under the uh, contact us. Uh, under the comments section, please mention the Rochester Business Alliance, the RBA, so that way we will in fact waive the fee associated with it and you'll get that uh, assessment done. And on a no fee basis. Bill, was that our only question? Some people are wondering how they get a copy of the slides, and that is easily accomplished. And just send a note right. to webinars at firestorm.com, and we will be happy to send you a copy of the slide deck. And uh, we'll try to follow up with everyone on today's call. It's obviously when you've got a number of people on a call, it's hard to answer everyone's question and have it relate specifically back to who they are. So we'll reach out individually to everyone on the call to see if you've got questions. We can get you a copy of the slides so that you can start to look at the planning requirements that you need to have within your area. So Bill, if that's got our questions, I'd like to thank the Rochester Business Alliance and I'd also like to thank Chip Dawson for his help today as we uh, are trying to share information that everyone needs in order to do the planning within their organization. Our next webinar is scheduled as part of the series uh, with uh, of When It Matters Most, December the 12th, uh, and it's from 10 to 11 a.m. So thank you all. If you've got questions, go to firestorm.com or send us an email at webinars at firestorm.com. We'll certainly be glad to answer your questions and help in any way that we possibly can. So have a great day. Good luck with the snow. Please don't send any of that snow down to Atlanta. Uh, and have a great weekend, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone, to you, your families. Enjoy this season. We clearly have a great deal to be thankful for in America today. Thanks, everyone. That concludes our webinar for today. Look forward to seeing you in December uh, to discuss when time matters most. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you, Jim.